This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? Well, with Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate. Then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. This show is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Seeking clarity in your financial journey? Schwab makes it easy for you to be an informed investor with transparent pricing, low costs, and no fee to work with a financial consultant. Schwab clearly explains their fees and helps you understand the common costs you can incur based on recommendations from your financial consultant. Visit schwab.com or swing by one of their 400 local branches to learn more. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest annual call-in show 2023 edition. It's Wednesday, December 20th, 2023. On today's show, we are going to run through some very cool listener questions. This is the annual show. We do it every year. We get to know you a little better. You get to know us a little better. No need for dithering or falderall. Uh, Let's go right to the intros. We've got uh, Julia Turner in the studio Face to face, you are still an embodied creature, I see. It's true. I have not just evanesced into the ether (laughs) over there on the West Coast. Here I am in boots. Uh, I'm larfing already, Julia. It's great to see you. And of course, Dana Stevens is the film critic for Slate and the author of a smash-up book about Buster Keaton. I still think about that book to this day. Hey, Dana. Hey, thanks so much, Steve. Of course. Um... So this is a fun one. I no reason not to dive right in, right? Let's listen to uh, the first question. Hi, this is Claire. I am a very longtime fan of the show. I have been wondering how your parents have shaped your taste and culture, whether there are specific things that you either love or have rejected because they were important to your parents. Uh, I'm a new parent myself, two young kids, so it's something that I've been thinking about. Thanks so much. Uh, love the show. Oh, wow. Who wants to call it in the outfield here? I mean, I feel like my answer to that is going to be the most boring one. So maybe I'll just get it out of the way. Like, I wish I had some sort of rebellion story about like, damn you, dad, I won't listen to Glenn Campbell albums. (laughs) But but the fact is, I feel this is actually in the in the acknowledgments to my book, Steve. I feel very grateful to my parents. We don't have the same tastes necessarily, but I just feel very grateful to them for making me a person who cares about culture because they both are in their own way and they i just grew up in a house where records were listened to and books were read and movies were seen and those things were talked about and i from that matrix developed the tastes that i did so that is a very dull answer (laughs) but maybe that will make a new parent feel good about not really having to worry about your choices that much you know i don't think it's that my parents were certainly not 21st century style parents who were carefully selecting wonderful objects for us to experience uh, although we did have some great kids records and books and things like that. Um, but it was more just an, an ambience of a house where culture mattered. OK, but you're right. Boring answer. But out of the ambience, <laughs> out of the ambience, can you pluck a thing that you still listen to, read, whatever mm. that is just totally evocative of their placing mm. it before you or, or using or consuming it themselves in the household. Right. I mean, from kid culture, I've actually talked about this on the show. I'm sure I've endorsed it. But the, the Nilsson album, The Point, the story record that we listen to on, in every car ride and that my kid now loves, uh, that's something that stayed with me and that my own kid experienced. But I feel like I need to pick something that isn't kid culture as well, like something that was my parents' thing. Um, Nilsson and Point, for, for the parent who wrote this in, is an absolute must. Like, your kid needs to grow up loving that record, right? Steve, mm-hmm. did you grow up with it, too? I don't or? know this record. What is this record? Ah, oh, okay. Well, you know Harry Nilsson, right? Yes. Uh, singer, songwriter, friend of the Beatles, uh, singer of that, that song from Midnight Cowboy that everyone knows and loves. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear words saying. Only the echoes of my mind 
He is a great songwriter, and uh, and he wrote a story album for children that was also made into an animated show for TV. But you have to get the album because the animated TV version is narrated by Ringo Starr, who's awesome and narrates it very well. But the album is narrated by Nelson himself. Years ago, there was a place called the Land of Point, and that was because everything in the Land of Point had one. The barns, the houses, the carts, everything, even the people. Everyone in the land of Point had a point on the top of his head. Everyone, that is, with the exception of Oblio. So it's just this beautiful thing of this man with a wonderful talking voice, an incredible singing voice, and he's a great songwriter, telling you this very 70s story about nonconformity, basically kind of a fable about nonconformity, and interspersing it with songs. So he just sort of talks and then segues into a song and then talks some more and then sings a song. And it's so marvelous. I mean, it's, that's actually a perfect answer. You don't have to come up with another because that was your gateway drug, first of all, to Harry Nilsson, but second of all, through him... You know, great song. Like, you wouldn't backtrack from Nilsson to shitty songwriting. Or, <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's just, that's that's wonderful. What, you, what about you, Julia? Uh, one formative cultural experience that I think back on is that when I, I don't know, was probably in, like, fifth or sixth grade, I read The Innocence Abroad by Mark Twain, and I didn't understand half the words in it, and I had a little custom with my grandmother, my mother's mother, where I would write down all the words I didn't know while I was reading it. And then when she was babysitting me, we would look them up together. And I remember learning the difference between solipsism and solecism, <laughs> uh, which I, I, if I were pressed to say it now, <laughs> I don't know that I could. But I know they're different. <laughs> um, you know, what culture felt like to me in my house growing up was one thing, and then as I've zoomed out on it later, I think I understand a little bit more about why it had the meaning that it did. You know, ours was a house where, like, it was exciting if the checkout lane said 10 items or fewer instead of 10 items or less, and we, like, all noticed that and talked about (laughs) it. And it was a crossword puzzle doing household. And my grandmother really was a key force in this. She moved up to Boston when I was in fourth grade or so, and we, she would take us to the ballet, and she would take us to the ART theater, and she would take us to the Mm. symphony sometimes, although that was the most boring because there was nothing to watch. And it just felt valuable to know things. I would do the crossword puzzle with her, and you would... You'd, of course you would know that there was a botanist Asa Gray, you know, spelled A-Y, and that was what you would put in. And, like, I, I don't know, I just grew up in this stew of, like, of course one wants to know about the world and consume its riches. Um, and then my dad's family was, like, much less interested in culture, and my dad's interest in culture was, like, a rebellion against, like, his dad's had bought, like, books by the foot to put in his office. Like, they were not interested in culture in that way and my dad was like a you know jazz hound in new york in the 60s and so he and my grandmother always connected on that well that's a great answer i also i love that in your household growing up a y was the alternate spelling for gray what do you mean did you say gray a y asa gray the botanist yeah, last name is spelled a y why it? would you specify a y for gray that's <laughs> e y is like the frou-frou <laughs> anglo spelling that's great a y julia <laughs> in a house that goes to the symphony they spell gray with an e y oh oh yes indeed <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't you imagine that like a british botanist's name would be e y fair enough <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, when you imagine about British botanists. <laughs> <laughs> As your family sits around discussing Although, honestly, the name spelling of British botanists. Is, is gray. Hold on, I'm going to look this up while you do yours, Steve. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Okay, so the quick answer to the question is none. And the more considered answer is none with an asterisk and a footnote, I guess, which is, you know, I mean, my situation is sort of unusual and there's no need to, like, spill out a memoir into the microphone. But, you know, I was this adopted kid. My dad was 40 when they retrieved me. Um, He was born, therefore, in 1924. Uh, The 60s were a completely alien phenomenon. I mean, they were like a a 
epistemic disruption that was impossible to process, much less countenance in any way. There was a sense of like wasp household withdrawal to the tiniest little hermetic nub in some sense. And what was culture in my house? Culture in my house was TV. You know, like we watched The Brady Bunch and my mom read Agatha Christie and my dad read The New York Times. And that was kind of about it. And so for me, it was always antithetical. I mean, the sense of like, okay, I'm just going to have to curate this for myself. You know, it's just obviously been a through line in my whole life, this like obnoxious <laughs> over curation of a cultural diet as if that somehow redefines who you are. What I will say is that I meant that I turned both vulnerably, but also very meaningfully to peers because they came from exceedingly different households than mine. I mean, these just like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I hate to be reductive and I really don't mean to be like stupidly philo-Semitic, but like these Jewish kids from the Upper West Side, like, I mean, to me, that was terra incognita. And they just came with a completely different sense of what you discuss at the dinner table, how you discuss it. Children are expected to hold a meaningful conversation even at a young age with their own parents. Their parents are really into like Lincoln Center and the symphony and the crossword. I mean, just the crossword puzzle. I mean, just anything. And this was like water on this desiccated plant. And um, so that's kind of my, I mean, God bless my parents. I don't mean to disrespect them. But the truth of the matter is that that is kind of how culture entered my household. Asa Gray is an American botanist, so <laughs> there you that go. explains the name spelling. <laughs> Oh, the A-Y spelling of gray. And then they all titter, the round robin of titters. I always thought it was the E. So I had to remember that it was A. Cameron, next question. Hi, Culture Gap Fest. Tom here calling in from East London in the UK. My question is, what is one chunky cultural artifact that is perceived with largely universal acclaim and love that you just can't quite get on board with? So it could be a film, a TV show, a novel that is widely recognized as brilliant and withstood the test of time, but you just don't quite see what all the fuss is about. Thank you for another year of glorious culture company, and I look forward to listening to more of your opinions in 2024. Bye. Did we answer this question just because of the delightful use of the word chunky? <laughs> Ch chunky. We I can't do it. Also, the signaling of air quotes with the intonation. Perfect. Oh, really well done. <laughs> Funky. Chef's kiss. Yeah. Um, I'll go first because mine is boring. Let's just let's just stipulate that. Boring I, person goes first. Boring person goes first. <laughs> the rule Dibs. of the stomach. That's the way to hook in the listeners. <laughs> Top load the boring. <laughs> We've got just unerring audience instincts today. Okay. Um, well, it's only boring because I've said it four times before, and I know my opinion is wrong and tiresome. I'm bored of it myself. But I hated crime and punishment because I did not. Uh, yeah, Steve's giving me a big thumbs down. Are you giving me a thumbs down to my opinion or thumbs down to crime and punishment? To crime and punishment. Oh, okay, wait. Well, let me say it. Maybe Steve wasn't listening the other times I said this on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just think the fundamental emotional problem of, of crime and punishment is stupid. Like uh, my main response to Raskolnikov's dilemma is just don't fucking kill the old lady. <laughs> and the whole book is fine. And then he spends the whole time rending his garments. Oh, I, they really catch me. I'm so guilty. Why did I kill her? And it's like, why did you kill her? That was so stupid. We're waiting, yeah. <laughs> like just, I do not care about your emotional storm and drunk because this was extremely avoidable if you had just sat down and done a crossword puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> and spell Asa Gray however you wanted. And I, but I will say, I also, I'm not proud to admit that because it's such a Philistine view. Although, Steve, if you want to come along and back me up on it, great. But, but I also had that with Hamlet for a little bit. <laughs> you had, me, you had me and you lost me. Well, no, but I, but I've turned around on Hamlet. So I, because I think I didn't understand that it was. I just read it too naively, and I thought he was indecisive, and I didn't realize he was, uh, like, I think when we actually, when we saw the, didn't we see Oscar Isaac yeah, in it for sure the show? Yeah, I, I think I'd seen a couple versions of it recently, but especially that one, I understood it more 
as being about grief in a different way, and it totally read differently to me. So I doubt I am correct about crime and punishment, and I bet if I read it again, I would have a different response. Steve, okay, no, back me up. Is crime and punishment stupid? (laughs) Two kinds of people. Tolstoy people, Dostoevsky people. Near the twain shall meet. Tolstoy people, brills. Dostoevsky people, loser posers. (laughs) (laughs) Next. (laughs) Okay. No, I'm going to take the novelist Elif Batuman, who loves Dostoevsky, and put her in the in the smart Dostoevsky likers category. Although I agree with you, I'm more a Tolstoy gal myself. I just haven't read deeply enough in the Russians either direction. Like I've read War and Peace and Crime and Punishment, and oh my god, some Bulgakov that I hated. Uh, Anyway. Yeah. Uh, What about you, Chunky? I don't know. This is a tough one for me because I have this. I think I have a masochistic relationship to to revered culture where I feel like it must be my fault. I, it must be mm. my fault that it's not working. Surely I'll get it the next time. You know, so I don't feel like I have a lot. And I also really can't stand, not that that's what this questioner is asking for, but I really can't stand that kind of, um, you know, casual dismissal. Like all the lists that appear like, ooh, Citizen Kane, overrated. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the kind of dumb eagerness to appear smart by dismissing beloved classic things. Um, because I tend to feel like if somebody made an enduring work of art, there's got to be some reason it's enduring. So let me think of some exceptions to that. I mean, well, I guess... pick one that you didn't respond to that you... You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are so many movies that are kind of in the classic yet not really good <laughs> sort of category. And so I feel like I'm not the first person to say, but like um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, right? Classic movie, has some sweet moments in it, obviously has like this very disturbing racist character from Mickey Rooney that now plays badly. But even putting that aside, like I never quite got the thing about that movie. I feel like it's sort of like an extended perfume commercial <laughs> <laughs> and it definitely doesn't capture what's magical about the book Breakfast at Tiffany's, in part because of how dated it is, you know, Mm. because it's very much a movie of its time and it's Audrey Hepburn and she has to be pure and sweet and you can't show her as the kind of, you know, more disturbing character that Holly Golightly was, more of a kind of Edie Sedgwick, you know, kind of like edgy, manic, messed up girl. Um, So that's a movie that while it's pleasant enough to watch her sing Moon River on the Fire Escape, I don't really enjoy watching. Also, there's just some bad acting in it. Like, I forget his name, but the guy who plays the romantic interest is not Audrey Hepburn worthy. George Papard. George Papard, of course, yes. Yeah, I think that movie feels a little bit leaden to me. It's like leaden whimsy. So (laughs) that's an example. (laughs) That's so good. I mean, does it count if you say Pulp Fiction? Sure. Yeah? I fucking hate that movie. Say more. That's what you're saying. I mean... I think part of it is, you know, I'll dovetail with my previous answer, which is you spend every waking day since like roughly third grade trying to reinvent yourself from the studs up by studying (laughs) the good taste of other people and hopefully weaving it into the fabric of your own soul. And you don't think of it as contingent on a generational worldview. And then all of a sudden... I think 94, right? Pulp Fiction and Rushmore come out simul- more or less simultaneously. And I'm like, who the fuck made these movies? And of course, in retrospect, the answer is it was Gen X flexing for the first time, like really flexing. For a brief window. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, But they both have this incredible staying power. They cannot be made to go away no matter what. And I was like so affronted. It was like... Clement Greenberg, who spent his whole career extolling abstract expressionism, abstraction, 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 and like this whole theory of like this oasis of civilization in a degraded, barbarous, industrial wasteland. And then all of a sudden, there's Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, and he just blows a fucking circuit. Like the, you, see, you are literally there for the paradigm shift. And you're like, God, everything I just invested a lifetime in believing about the world and myself up in fucking smoke, these little sniveling show off these shits. And I was like, but it was also, it was that horrible feeling of like, it, it, like I actually really legitimately don't like either movie and I have liked things that each of them have done, but I hate those movies. But there was a part inside of me that vibrated at each one of those screenings, which was like, it really works. Like I see how it works and I see for whom it works and I'm going to be living with these two until I'm in the grave. 
Oh, my God. I remember seeing Pulp Fiction and being like, what yeah, is this? A revolution. What are movies? This is good. like, yeah. I'm part of the future, and it's going to be so fun. <laughs> and I sensed that. <laughs> Some A.Y. Gray spelling, E.Y. Gray spelling <laughs> twit out there was like, ooh, pop culture. <laughs> I responded really strongly to both those movies. I wouldn't say I loved Pulp Fiction at the time, but I had that feeling of excitement and thrill at something new which is also how Boogie Nights kind of made me feel, except I loved that. And Rushmore to this day, we've talked about this in every Wes Anderson conversation we have. Like, that's one of the few Wes Anderson movies that remains dear to me and that I like to rewatch. But yeah, I see exactly what you mean, Stephen. It was also the time of Paul Thomas Anderson's debut, right? I mean, right around the same few years there, if not the same year. And so there was a kind of sense that our generation or whatever, I mean, I'm not super identified with our generation, but, you know, that people in our kind of, you know, historical time frame and and reference world were starting to make big art. And that was exciting in itself. And that was Heart 8? Was that his? Heart 8 was his debut. And I just don't remember what year it was. But Boogie Nights was his breakthrough breakthrough. that people actually saw. And I find it what just we don't need to belabor it, but he went from someone who I kind of classed with them and I was like, you know, Reach exceeding his grasp, like, fuck you, go be born three years earlier and let's talk. And he turned into, to my mind, a magnificent filmmaker. Like, he matured sort of in public in the process of making his work. And now I just revere him. I stand by my opinion about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that it is a beautiful, mature work. I love that movie. From Quentin realizing that... All of his obsessions are stupid and powerless. That's a great movie. That's my, by far my favorite movie of his. It's so good. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. How do you know when to seize the moment for growth? When the opportunity arrives, you need to be ready. That means future-proofing your business with a technology partner, like SAP, and embracing AI with confidence. My name is Kavita Ganesan. I'm the author of The Business Case for AI, and I advise leaders and tech teams on how to go about their AI initiatives. AI is a special type of software automation which tries to solve complex problems, like it can ingest lots of data and then render one decision. Companies have barely scratched the surface with AI. If you take an industry like supply chain, their data is all over the place. You have data in procurement, you have data in sales, you have data in manufacturing. So you need a single platform to bring all of that data together and help analyze that data. Companies are slowly going to start integrating AI into their workflows. That will change the whole business landscape. So instead of doing all the low-level work, people will be the data creators for AI systems. Having AI in the loop will help businesses become more sustainable over the long term, survive different problems, shutdowns. So I'm excited about the prospects of that. Relevance, reliability, responsibility. Future-proof your business with SAP Business AI. Head to sap.com slash be ready to learn more. You want control of your financial future, and Schwab knows that. That's why when it comes to managing your wealth, Schwab gives you more choices, like full-service wealth management and advice when you need it most. You can also invest on your own and trade on Think or Swim, their powerful, award-winning trading platforms. Plus, you'll get low costs, transparent pricing, and 24-7 live help. Because Schwab understands it's your financial journey, and they believe you should have choices in how you invest. Visit schwab.com to learn more. All right. Well, before we go any further, now is the moment in our podcast where we typically discuss business. Dana, what uh, what do we have? Steve, there's only one item of business this week. That is to tell listeners about today's Slate Plus segment. Every year for our listener call-in episode, we usually answer one bonus question, an extra question that overflows into Slate Plus. This year, we had so many great questions, we're going to answer two bonus questions, one of which I know is going to involve the show's feature of endorsements and Endorsements that have stuck with us through the years from our fellow co-hosts or ones that we want to re-endorse ourselves, just some that have really stayed on our mind over the years. If you're a Slate Plus member, you'll hear us talk about that and probably other stuff, too, at the end of the episode. If you're not a Slate Plus member, you can become one at slate.com slash culture plus. 
What do you get when you're a member? Ad-free podcasts, bonus segments like the one I just described, which many other shows have as well, and of course, unlimited access to all of the writing and all of the podcasting on Slate.com. You'll never hit a paywall if you're a Slate Plus member, and you will be supporting the magazine and helping keep this podcast afloat. So please sign up today at Slate.com slash Culture Plus. Once again, that's Slate.com slash Culture Plus. Okay, back to the show. All right, let's take another question here. Hi, this is Brian. I am a longtime GabFest listener living in London, but originally from Yelton, Massachusetts. So shout out to Julia and her memories of video to go. I've been listening to the GabFest probably since I moved here in around 2010. And obviously you have talked about so many pop cultural figures, pop musicians, I've followed all your opinions on the Taylor Swift boards, the evolving um, takes on Beyonce and her evolution, Dana's um, affiliation with Lady Gaga coming through the love of her daughter. But there is a singular pop figure that, I, to the best of my knowledge, you have never talked about, someone who actually broke open that space and in many ways defined it for those other people to fill, and that is Madonna. Have you ever talked about Madonna on the Gab Fest? I have no memory of it, Julia. What do you... I don't know that we have. Also, I love the the dear close listening and oh my god, video to go. Love it. Shout out right back at you. Um, I don't know. I admire Madonna. I admire her her capacity for self possession. I feel like I was such a young and naive culture consumer when she was a big, big, big deal. That I'm curious what you guys made of her because I she just was like the heir. Like my daughter last night, who was two and a half, was singing Taylor Swift lyrics. Literally when we got out of the car from the airport, she said, Welcome to New York. It's been waiting for you. <laughs> Taylor Swift's worst shit. song. <laughs> oh, shit. Um and I feel like I absorb Madonna in that way, like just ambient yeah. box, ambient. you know, yeah. and sort of like a little bit girl power and a little bit like cone bras, you know, like just just so un all of my critical faculties had not yet been developed. I will also say that Madonna's Immaculate Collection, you know, greatest hits album was one of the three albums I wrote my senior thesis to in college because I knew all the words so well. It was basically wordless. So I it was Yola Tango, I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One, Slater Kinney, The Hot Rock, and Madonna's Immaculate Collection were just the constant, like, pep, 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 high energy, write your whole thesis too fast because you were editing the newspaper instead and it's too soon uh, soundtrack. So I love Madonna, but I don't have a ton of critical faculties. And then I would like to talk about the current state of Madonna once we hear what you guys made of Madonna and her heyday. Yeah, I mean, I think th she was part of the air as part of the answer of maybe why we haven't discussed her. And this is not exactly Madonna's fault that she falls into this little historical spot where I don't think she feels like a formative artist for any of us quite. I mean, I'm a few years older than you, Julia, so I could have if I wanted to, you know, gone to high school dressed like Madonna with a million bracelets and, you know, layering lace fingerless gloves and everything while that was all happening. Um, and I remember that happening and some girls having that fever and I just never caught it. And I think in part of it, part of it was that I was just a little snob and she was too popular and seemed like, you know, something that I wanted to reject in order to form an identity against mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And that maybe insofar as there was a Madonna versus Cindy Lauper girls kind of thing, I would be more of a Cindy Lauper girl. Not that I was wearing sideways pink ponytails either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think except for one album... The album that she made, I'm not going to remember the name of the album, and I'll have to look it up. The album that she made right after she and Sean Penn broke up, which is a great album and has a lot of really, you know, hard songs about that abusive and, and difficult relationship. There was never a, a Madonna album that really mattered to me that I actually sort of owned and put on. I think she was more somebody that you'd get out on the dance floor because, you know, Like a Prayer or some big hit was on. Certainly somebody could pop, you know, craft a pop song. But I never would have dreamed of going and seeing her in concert. And I also have to say, not to be ungracious, but I have not loved how Madonna has handled her late career in stardom. Like speaking of Lady Gaga, who the, the caller mentioned, Madonna has said some really ungracious things about like Lady Gaga stealing her vibe or something like that. 
And it's just it's incredibly ungracious to say about a younger artist who reveres you so much. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Gaga has never said anything but, you know, wonderfully complimentary things about how important Madonna was to her as a person forming her musical sensibility. And Madonna turns around and kind of says, like, oh, well, they're all biting my shit, including Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe she's a lovely person in her private life. I have no idea. But I think she could be handling her um, her late period diva dumb better than she has. Right. Um, so, you know, for me, the sort of advent of Madonna is inseparable from two things. One is the arrival of MTV is the taste maker for young people. She coincided with its birth along with Michael Jackson and the Thriller video, which made made it work as a business model. I mean, they were failing until Thriller. But Madonna was right there, came in with him, um, and then just the video became... You, you simply didn't make a pop or rock record without accompanying video. Um, I mean, she's revolutionary in being a woman who owned her sexuality without shame or fear of punishment and she wasn't punished right that's a cultural watershed like and there's I mean, there nothing like i mean i mean the like of virgin video is the thing that just absolutely broke her i mean as you've never seen anything like that on a you know, main, in a mainstream outlet. I mean, it just her in the gondola, her in the... And then she performs it on the MTV Video Awards in that wedding dress, and she's just down on the floor. I mean, you're like, this is... And I'm not trying to be prurient. I think she was the biggest, most impressive pop charismatic since Elvis in some sense. I mean, I, in that sense, like, I just really admire what she was. What she's become, I defer to you guys, but I basically agree. I mean... I mean, the thing I will say, which I don't feel good about feeling, is that even as a young girl, I could tell that she was, like, articulating a way of being a woman that was strange to people and interesting, and that interested me as I was thinking through what it was to be a woman. And I intellectually respect the right of everybody to do whatever they want with their face when they get older. But it's so depressing, this woman who literally made new shapes for women's bodies to be. Was like, I decide what shape women's bodies are. Breasts are cones now. To to see her fall under the fog of the Instagram filter and the fillers and the Jocelyn Wildenstein, it's like, what? No, you decide. <laughs> You're letting this, like, gross Botox... I, I, I have this, like, revulsion to the way her face looks now that is... I mean, I can't believe I said that. You're not allowed to be revolted by other women's bodies, repulsed, whatever. But, like, I'm just like, Madonna, what the fuck? Where are, where'd you go? Where did Madonna go? Like, what's under there? I don't know. It, it, I find it really depressing. In relation to that, this is not to do with Madonna, but Pamela Anderson, who is another obviously sex symbol of a somewhat overlapping time, has this new thing where she's appearing on red carpets with no makeup on. Have you seen any, yeah, any yeah. of this? And, and it's fashion week. And, and it's awesome. I mean, she looks amazing and she is just being completely, I'm just over it. I don't feel like wearing makeup right now, <laughs> you know, and she, she looks great. Anyway, that, love her. Before we close out the Madonna segment, I just have to say that I looked it up and that album is called True Blue from 1986. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. Toyota Thon is on, so stop in and get a great deal on an off-road ready RAV4 or spacious Highlander, both with available all-wheel drive. Find out more at buyatoyota.com. Hurry, Toyota Thon ends January 2nd. Toyota, let's go places. All right, let's uh let's listen to another one. Hi, this is Catherine Gale from Berkeley, California. My question is, do you always read the acknowledgments? And if you do, what do you think makes for a good acknowledgment section? Do you think the author is obligated to think about the readers other than the people who are being mentioned when they write that section? I'll just add that I thought of this because of the plus segment that you did on how you choose your next read. I've actually found many of my next authors and books from reading the acknowledgments of a book that I loved and had just completed. Thank you. 
I love acknowledgments so much, and I'm so excited about this question, but I will reserve my remarks on the matter until we get to you guys. Steve, do you always read the acknowledgments? Mm, no, maybe I glance at them. I mean, but what? I, have, I, have, I have thoughts about acknowledgments. First, okay, okay, share your thoughts, and then we, and then, and then we'll have to pillory you for not reading them more closely. What are your thoughts? Well, here are two things off the bat I object to about acknowledgments. The full well, three actually, but the first is that it's you know like. The author basically saying, okay, here's my mafia. Don't fuck with me and don't fuck with this book, right? <laughs> like, here's my super A-list agent. Here are my three most famous literary friends. You fuck with me, you fuck with them. So have at it, but consequences. The second is if it's a, particularly if it's a white male author, the incredibly condescending last line of every single one about the long-suffering spouse, fuck you, come on, get beyond that, please stop. Um, and then the kind of it, it, acknowledgments page has suffered from the same self-serving hypertrophy as everything else in global culture. Like books ought to be immune from every other cultural. Well, no, nah, it's not quite right. But I mean, you know, you want books to have a degree of immunity from certain meretricious trends. They just got so long. They're so fucking long. They're like a story in and of itself about the genesis of the book. It's like a fucking buildings roman at the back of every goddamn book. You know what I like about an acknowledgments page? None was the best. <sighs> I never heard that sound. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, keep going. Oh my god! That's very. It's like you've never witnessed an anesthesia-free amputation before. <gasps> uh, anyway, uh, but if if you're gonna have one, it's like short and sweet. We don't need your life story. Interesting. All right. Well, I obviously have a strong response to that, but I feel like we got to get Dana on the record. I, like, I mean, as someone who just wrote an acknowledgments page that both of you are on, I take personal <laughs> offense that you wish it didn't exist and were shorter. I'll be happy to trim you next time. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Touche. Okay. No, I will I, say I scan them for my name. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really honestly feel like having had to sort of think about how to put one together that I feel like it has the exact opposite function of what you were just describing. Like you're trying to bring people out of the shadows, you know, who who otherwise might not be thanked, like some, you know, librarian who's thanklessly toiling away and found you some manuscript that nobody else could find. Like I kept a list. In fact, I opened a file called Acknowledgements like early, early in the process of writing my book. And it was sort of a bucket in which I would throw different names and a brief description of what that person did. And some people got on, got taken off the list because they subsequently were unhelpful. <laughs> <laughs> but but mainly it was a list of, of friends. And I, I like when an acknowledgments page tells the story of the writing of the book to some degree. I mean, it should do it in a lapidary manner, but it's, it's, it's not worth reading if it's just a list of proper names, right? You want to have a little bit of framing around each name. So, for example, I have a group of friends that gets together every fall. Every October, we gather at this one friend's house in Massachusetts. And this has been happening for, I mean, since before my kid was born, so probably for 20 years or so. Um and there's always a great exchange of ideas and books and things there. And none of those people directly, except for one who did a really heroic late period read of a, of a draft and helped edit it, none of them had any direct impact on my book. But they all had an impact on my life and my thinking and, you know, my world. And so there's like a little sentence about that and about that gathering and those people. That's just one example. But I feel like a good acknowledgments page, which I do read, if I care about the book, I'm going to if only because you want to stay in the book's world, right? There's that sad moment when you finish a really good book and you think, I wish there was a little bit more, you know, like a fanfic extension. And that's kind of what the acknowledgments page can be when it's well done, I think. Um, I don't know. I guess I want to get a little bit of a sense of, of who that writer is and what their world was like as they were writing the book. And it is true that it almost always ends on an acknowledgment of the family. And of course, if it's, you know, one of those very old school, like, thank you to Barbara for typing it all up or whatever. <laughs> Poor fucking Barbara. <laughs> but, but that's so old school. I feel like the, the, yeah, the family right. acknowledgment to me was really important. Like, how exactly do I word this so that they themselves, not so that other people will think, you know, whatever, they, <laughs> this person has a family but so that my actual family will understand 
Your how gratitude. important their patience was because yeah. it does require a lot of patience and a lot of disappearance. Like, bye, I'm not going to your concert, <laughs> you know, your school concert. I don't think I miss too many important things like that. But yeah, there's a lot of skipping out mm. on things that you could have done with your family. Trips, entire trips that I didn't take with my family because I was doing some incredibly arcane book thing. So it's a real pleasure to have this moment of saying like, oh, I'm a person who has a body moving through time who wrote this book. And I like to know that about the authors that I like. So, all right. I think that that my appreciation for this section may be even more avid than yours and falls between yours and in kind of emotional valence because I like never, ever don't read the acknowledgments if they exist of a book that I finished because I find them to be such a potentially revealing document. Be- and I think they seem like an impossible writing assignment that demands and creates great like risks and vulnerabilities for the writer. And so it's like a high wire act in which this person who's just achieved or not achieved something in the form of the book then has to like operate in a totally different mode and Sometimes it's just a disaster. Sometimes it is a disaster of boringness. Sometimes it's a disaster of treacliness. Sometimes it compounds and confirms what you loved about the book and its economy or its precision or its beauty. Like, I just find them to be incredibly revealing, interesting documents. I like how they are a little off-ramp of the book. Like, they give you a little bit of a, like, you get to hang on in the in the same brain space that made this world for you and learn a little bit more about that brain space. But I love it. I feel like um, sometimes you can read between the lines and be like, is this person having an affair? <laughs> like, is this person, like, what's going on in their families? Uh, did they secretly hate their publisher? <laughs> like, you There's know, some shade in mine if you know how to look. How perfunctorily did they thank all the publicity assistants? <laughs> like, how much of a dick are they? And I will say, for all that we hear about Netflix skipping to the next episode before they get through the credits, I have this issue with Kindle, which once you get to, the, like, the final page of a book is, like, want to review it? And I'm like, no, I want to go to the next fucking page and read the acknowledgments, you asshole. <laughs> and, like... It's very hard. I mean, it's not that hard, but you have to, like, be thoughtful about your taps to not, like, zoom out of the book entirely and then have to go back to it from the beginning and then go to the table of contents and find the acknowledgments This page. goes to my hobby horse that ebooks, however you feel about them versus print, are not well designed for reading and they have a lot of anti-reader features that I've, I've noticed. Kindle needs to get his shit together about the acknowledgments page and understand what a crucial part of the reading experience it is. But, like, thank God I've never had to write one. It seems like a godforsaken writing assignment and... Um, when someone pulls one off elegantly, it makes me um, appreciative of their success. I also will feel like one friend of mine, I, I of course, do also check for my name. I don't, that's not the purpose of it, but I do always check if, if I know the author, and it's always interesting and nice to see yourself there if you're there. Um, although one good friend of mine described me as shrewd, in his description of me, and I was like, mm. I, I think I am shrewd. Is it bad to be shrewd? That seems like a compliment. No, I think it's good to be shrewd, but it just wasn't the word I expected, and it stuck with me. You are shrewd. He's an acute novelist and writer, and the, a, the acuity extended to the So now you have to write a book so you can call him acute and whatever the rest of that was. Um, oh, I don't know what I would call him. Well, he would get thanked if I ever wrote a book, but I don't think he has a lot to fear on that front. <laughs> <laughs> I um, Counterpoint. So this lovely little bit of afterlife after the book is over. Um, I just finished, finally, I finished the masterful Rachel Cusk trilogy, you know, the outline trilogy. And you get to that last page and she finally gives herself a name and I mean, this doesn't give anything away I don't think she gives herself a name and is in the first person and you get this just tour de force literary set piece about which I won't say anything but really casts an interesting shadow let's call it over the entirety of the project and then nothing right it's that that feeling all the feelings at once of like the bluntness and abruptness of any literary ending, because if you're if you're in a novel, you are in it. It is in your head, and you are in that world. 
and then that world disappears and it disappears in the moment with no lingering anything. And that's a very powerful experience. Um, but also, um, then that followed by that feeling of the nine year old who's just had a birthday party and the sugar high is over and everyone's left and you're bereft. And that feeling to me is just precious. That's when I know this is inside me forever. That so. seems extremely cusky to not do that, to not do the endorsements or the acknowledgements. I love it. Oh, it's boom. I think it's even the yeah. back cover of the book. Not even, you don't even get a blank page on which to scrawl <laughs> your own afterthought. <laughs> I love it. Toyota Thon is on. So stop in and get a great deal on a rugged new Tacoma or Tundra. Ready to tackle the toughest weather. Find out more at buyatoyota.com. Hurry, Toyota Thon ends January 2nd. Toyota, let's go places. All right, next one. Hi. If you had to choose one, could you name a book or author or idea that had the biggest impact on you earlier in life? Which book is it, and what about it was important for you either at the time or to this day? And in what ways has the impact of books or certain authors or their ideas changed for you as you become older? Thanks. Well, we've discussed at length on this show the influence on me of a certain children's book called Need a House <laughs> Call Ms. Mouse about a mouse architect that uh, I took as inspiration to become an editor. So we need to discuss that no further, but I will remind everybody that the book has been reissued thanks to the assiduous attentions of our listeners. So thank you very much, and please go buy Need a House Call Ms. Mouse for all your friends and family for Christmas. But when I was thinking about this, I realized that Although I was raised to read Mark Twain and listen to jazz and go birding and know how to spell Asa Gray's name, although not his nationality, um, I did a semester program when I was a junior in high school on a farm. And in my English curriculum at my basic high school was like history of literature, American and English. Let's read The Green Knight. Let's start with Beowulf and go to the present. Beowulf through Toni Morrison. It was very, like, literature. Um, and in the curriculum of this farm semester, we read a bunch of contemporary nonfiction, including Wendell Berry, who I didn't, who was interesting but wasn't the one who resonated most for me, John McPhee's Control of Nature, because there was sort of an environmental and ecological focus, and Bad Land by Jonathan Rabin. And of those books... Um, and I'm sure there were more, but just studying contemporary nonfiction as English class was like really a um, kind of a revolution in my thinking because I definitely was growing up in this house where like culture was the ballet. And I was also raised by journalists who, you know, my parents had friends who wrote books. My dad wrote a book about Dukakis. Like I was aware of nonfiction books as a thing, but a little bit less as like I think I was unaware of literary nonfiction, if that's a category, right. or of of whatever it is that's between, a, like, an article in a newspaper and a novel. And so this experience in the semester program, both, I, I was particularly moved by the John McPhee, which I was like, oh, journalism can be this? This is really interesting to me. And then I got back, and I think the subsequent summer, and I forget why, but I read the book Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozel, which is a book about uh, public education in America and in particular has a harrowing set of coverage of public education in East St. Louis that was just so illuminating. You know, I grew up how I grew up and I went to this fancy school and I had well-meaning parents and cared about the world and wanted it to be a better place and was a smart and hopeful young person and I just was devastated by that book like I didn't I yeah. just didn't there was just so much I didn't understand and reading that helped me just helped me begin to like see around the corner of my own experience into how much world there was out there and what a narrow little corner of it I was living in so I guess it's those joint experiences of realizing the power of an ambitious approach to nonfiction, which is probably part of how I ended up as a journalist. I really was not inculcated my, by my parents to become a journalist. They never wanted me to. I always thought I would be an architect or a lawyer or a professor. 
But I think in some ways those childhood encounters with like the power of reporting to open people's eyes maybe is part of how my I found my way back into the family trade. How old were you when you read that book? Probably my uh, junior, senior year, high school. Mm-hmm. Great answer. Um, Danny, you want to take it next? Or? Yeah, I was choosing something a little bit earlier, but not a childhood book exactly. In fact, this is a book that I think of as kind of a liminal, like maybe the first work of great literature intended for adults that I read, which was Jane Eyre, which I read in seventh grade, still one of my probably top five novels in the world. Um, and I didn't read it in a class or it wasn't assigned. It wasn't on a reading list. As I remember, it was on a library table where they were either selling old books or giving old books away. And so I just sort of took this book because it was there. And I have this very visceral memory of walking across the parking lot of the school, you know, heading to go home and uh, and starting to open the book and read it and then and just kind of falling into it, you know, and that became this book that I would just open to any page and read for years to come. I don't know if that copy still exists in my parents' house, but it may. Um and yeah, I think that that was it was such a familiar format to me, like a book about an orphan who goes and makes good, like every girl's book is about that. And books that I grew up reading, like uh, The Secret Garden and uh, Little Princess, there's all Why? these orphan books. None of them books, have right? parents. They're, they never have parents. But the, the thing that I think I didn't realize until and I didn't even at the time in seventh grade realize it. But what what I was doing was kind of going to the source of that myth. Right. Like the the girl orphan who makes good myth. I think, um, you know, you can look for it in other places, too. But I feel like it really took root with Charlotte Bronte and, and Jane Eyre and whatever it was that set her way of telling that very familiar archetypal story apart, which is really just the voice, you know, just being inside yeah. the brain of this narrator in a way that, which I didn't know at the time, was sort of new in literary history, right? Um, had that same effect on me that it had on readers in 1847 who went wild for Jane Eyre because it was something entirely new. I know. And today, still, right? It's like you're so in there with her. Yeah, it's I have I have not yet known crazy. anyone to crack that book who doesn't finish it within a two day span. And in fact, there's all these funny stories at the time of like the, the publisher of Jane Eyre, right, who gets this anonymous manuscript out of nowhere, doesn't know what it is. One of his readers reads it and stays up all night reading it, gives it to his boss, George Smith, who ended up publishing the book, and says, "You got to read this one." And then George Smith stays up all night, and he has this funny story about how he had all these appointments during the day. He was supposed to, you know, go to some guy's club and, you know, whatever. And he was canceling all his appointments and having a sandwich in his room so that he could keep on reading the book. So, yeah, it's a drug. I love it. Um, so, I mean, the, the quick and disposable answer is, you know, at a certain age is part of my friends handing me things in order to remake me. Um, you know, I hit the totally predictable you know, late middle school, high school, early high school canon, right? Of like Catcher in the Rye, Slaughterhouse Five, Catch Twenty Two, and these were my Bibles. No, there's nothing to say about them. What really happened next was that in college, I still had a very restricted canon, you know, built on and around such works. And I guess I wanted, you know, what's the quickest way to become a sort of atti attitudinizing know-it-all when, in fact, you know nothing is you read Nietzsche. And I started reading Nietzsche, and I fucking loved it. I was like, this <laughs> shit's crazy, because like, I didn't really know. And you're like, holy shit, they let you read this here? Like, you can just go check it out at the library and read it? But this guy's fucking what he's saying is insane. <laughs> and of course, it's the very worst thing to inject into the veins of a, you know, insecure 19-year-old boy. And I wrote it for all it was worth. But the truth is, he's, a, you know, he's an incredibly supple, poetic, very beautiful in his way, tender, brighter. I mean, he's not, the cartoon of him is totally false of the Ubermensch. I mean, he's a dangerous drug, believe me. But, um, and then from there, and this is really the real answer, is that very quickly... I discovered a book that's going to sound stupid, but actually wasn't stupid at all. It's called The New Nietzsche, Contemporary Styles of Interpretation. And I have it up here on my computer screen. And when I say I look at this and it literally is just my college, like it just brings me back <laughs> to college because here the contributors are. It's uh, Derrida, Heidegger, Deleuze. I mean, they're not contributors in the sense that they contributed new material, I don't think. I mean, all of it, I think, is archival, but it was collected and it's basically Derrida, Heidegger, Deleuze, um, Blanchot, and a couple of other, 
you know, these giants of literary theory talking about the influence of intelligently, like their essays about the influence of Nietzsche on contemporary thought. And I was like, okay, that's fucking mind blowing, right? As a style of interpretation and by extension being in the world. And even though Foucault's not in there, that led me to Foucault. And Foucault was like, that was the Bible for a number of years, like the Foucault reader. And then from there, various of his works. But this idea of like, I mean, talk about criticism, like through an act of critical daring, remaking one's conception of the world, which does derive, I mean, it derives from many people, but Nietzsche being one of the big ones, into Foucault, into what literary theory became. And that's why I went to graduate school. It was like that critical daring to me was just oh, such a drug. And it's, it can be powerful, but it's been abused and degraded so badly um, for reasons that we don't need to go into. I think I'm, I'm over it. And I see shades of the adolescent poser in in quite a lot of it. But anyway, that book was just defining for me in the mid eighties in college. All right. Well, why don't, why don't we do one more? Hi, my name is Georgia, longtime listener, big fan of the Gab Fest. My question is about sleep. I have a 20 month old. And so sleep these last two years has turned into a highly valuable commodity, but it used to be that I'd sacrifice a good night of sleep for a page turner or a long movie or a late night comedy show. So my question is, how often do you trade a good night of sleep for a great read or a great watch? And when's the last time you just said, fuck it, I'll be tired tomorrow. Thanks. Love the show. (laughs) (laughs) The sleep versus culture matrix. (laughs) (laughs) Who wants to grab this one? I mean, I feel like I'm cursed answering this one because I have a friend who may be listening to the show right now who will never forgive me for once saying it must have been on a call-in show. It's the only time this would have come up when somebody asked something similar. A a new parent was talking about sleeplessness. And I said something about, yeah, but once in a while, you got to say fuck it and stay up all night. (laughs) And he, to this day, says that is the worst piece of new parent advice that's ever been given. You're destroying your listeners' health. But yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't even have a little kid anymore. But the last time I said, fuck it, I'm staying up all night was probably like last week. (laughs) You do this all the time? I mean, more often it's for meeting a deadline, you know, but the reason that I'm staying up to meet that deadline is because I was, you know, procrastinating on some other bedtime. There's that great Japanese word, which I'll never remember the syllables of, that means literally translates as revenge bedtime procrastination. You've heard of that, right? Yeah. Like the, the the idea that you're just so resentful that you didn't get any time during the day for yourself, that you just take it mm. out of your own night. I think I'm really, really guilty of that a lot because I'm a night person and I like staying up alone when everybody else is asleep doing sneaky cultural things. So, yeah, that's something that I probably do too much. But the fact that I do it too much indicates that there is some pleasure or benefit to be had there. I love it. I... I was a very bad sleeper as a kid. I think it just like maybe I'm a night person and my kid bedtimes were too early. But I remember like endless hours of like daydreaming and having flashlights under my bed to read after my parents turned me off. One time we like made a flashlight in a science unit learning about batteries and I like kept this jerry rigged thing under my bed. And now I'm like a very, I mean, not good, but, you know, I, I plug my phone in in the other room I have good sleep hygiene, I guess is what I'm saying. I like don't buy my phone is never in my bed. I go to the bed. I read my Kindle and I and it I love my stories and then they make me drowsy and then I go to sleep. And like unless I'm traveling, I I usually, you know, dabble a little bit with my ambient or melatonin if I have like sleep disruption or something. But I'm basically a solid sleeper. And I would also say moving to um, California makes you an early bird. Like, there is this hegemony of East Coast time as sort of being time. (laughs) And, like, it really is true. Like, restaurants aren't open as late, and I'm much more of a morning person now. Like, I don't, I don't, I feel like if I do too much thinking or working after I put my kids to bed, I just get, I get, I like reset into a whole new level of awakeness for hours. So I'd rather just go to bed at 10 and get up at like five. And, ha- and have my free, nobody else is around hours in the morning. Um, 
So it's very rare. But but if I'm reading a book and it's the sort of my my characters are in peril, sometimes I'll have a mini version of that where instead of reading for 20 minutes and drowsing off, I'll read for an hour and 20 minutes. But I'm pretty disciplined. I would say the thing that I'm more willing to blow up sleep for is conviviality, mm-hmm. yeah. like social fun. Like I hate I want. I like fun, and when fun is happening, I like to be doing fun. I'm not very yo or FOMO-y. Like I'm not. I don't have a. I don't. I don't truck much with regret, but <laughs> like just as a thing. <laughs> Steve is giving me the funniest look. <laughs> so perfect. Um, but but if I hear of an opportunity for hijinks. I'll often say yes to hijinks. So I'm more likely to sacrifice sleep for hijinks than for culture. Mm, Okay. So I think I was a good sleeper up until I had a five-week preemie kid 21 years ago, almost exactly 21 years ago. It savaged my circadian being to the absolute fucking core. Um, And I don't know that I ever fully recovered. And then... so. Subsequently, my biggest problem is super early morning insomnia, right? Mm. And what that does is, like, especially as you start to hit a certain age and you have two kids and on and on, you're like, okay, well, (laughs) I cannot treat this as a candle with two ends or I'm just fucked, you know? So I tend to go to bed early and then I move to somewhere rural where the sun goes down at 2.15 p.m. and there are no artificial <laughs> lights anywhere and the sheer volume of darkness surrounding your entire house is kind of it just triggers something. And so for me, it's like, uh-oh, shit, it's 9.15. How am I going to get through tomorrow? You know, I mean, it's like the habit of kind of, you know, just winding down at a comically early like blue plate special hour um got into my system and i i'm happy to say that like with the synaptic crackle and pop of being back in a city where there are you know like people in street lamps and shits open whenever uh i now go to bed 10 10 15 <laughs> <laughs> 10 30 but the one really weird thing about me and it doesn't happen very often but when it does it's like a fucking sight to behold is i have a second win like nobody's fucking business the push through to yeah, that yeah. steve is like a like a little bit frightening it's definitely like put your copy of zarathustra back in your back pocket there dude like that's the problem my second wind is unrelenting and so i don't want to trigger it it's like, I got to go to bed early or second wind Julia will come in and then I'll be up till three. And then uh, th- my life does not sustain that. Like one night up till three fucks up everything for three weeks. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I'm just like, it's like a life of trying to keep second wind Julia tamped down. <laughs> I don't know if I ever met second wind yeah, Julia. you have. You have. <laughs> you luckily have never met second wind Steve. <laughs> Julia, how freaking fun is it to do this all in the same room? It's really nice. It's so nice to see you guys. Yeah. And I loved our listeners' questions this year. Such a good crop. Thank yeah, you all. Yeah, we had for... to leave a lot by the wayside that would have been great. Yeah, and we'll pick those up in plus plus weeks to come. So, uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for the great questions. Yeah, really strong. And uh, Dana, really fun. As ever. As ever. Yeah, a real delight. Okay, you'll find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page. That's slate.com slash culturefest. And you can email us at culturefest at slate.com. Our introductory music is by Nicholas Bertel. Our production assistant is Kat Hong. Our producer is Cameron Drews. For Dana Stevens and Julia Turner, I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you soon.
Toyota Thon is on. So stop in and get a great deal on an off road ready RAV4 or spacious Highlander, both with available all wheel drive. Find out more at buyatoyota.com. Hurry, Toyota Thon ends January 2nd. Toyota, let's go places. Toyota Thon is on. So stop in and get a great deal on a sporty new Camry or stylish Corolla, both with available all wheel drive. Find out more at buyatoyota.com. Hurry, Toyota Thon ends January 2nd. Toyota, let's go places.